Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my channel. I'm very excited because we have our first guest on my channel. I will be interviewing Sarah. She is a fellow language learner and has learned Spanish by herself. And I'm very excited to talk with her about her language learning journey, um, some other things about her and ways that she has found language learning um, to be definitely possible on your own at home. Um, and I asked you guys some questions that you shared with me that you wanted to know, and I'm excited to ask, ask her those questions as well as some of my own. So hopefully everything you wanted to learn about <laughs> language learning will be answered in this video. Um, so first off, Sarah, mm -hmm. you could introduce yourself, maybe a little bit about um, your language learning journey and then your past, maybe some of your interests and just um, introduce yourself to everyone. Okay. Yeah. So my name is Sarah and I, so I have a YouTube channel as well and an online education language learning based business. And basically I transitioned from teaching full-time for several years and then into this online teaching environment. And now I teach language learning. So I learned Spanish as a second language starting from nothing. As a as a teenager, I started seriously studying Spanish when I was about 18. I stayed a little bit in high school, but mostly when I started college. And I took several classes, but that really wasn't enough for me to achieve the level of fluency that I have today. It was it, quite a bit of practice on my own as well as those classes and working with various teachers and tutors and pretty much everything over the years. Cool. Yeah. I um I'm definitely glad to have you on this channel. And I also um that was interesting that part that you said about um mm -hmm. like learning in the classroom because I have mm -hmm. I shared the same thought on that. Um, mm -hmm. cause I also think it's interesting that there's definitely not like a one size fits all mm -hmm. when it comes to language learning. And a huge part of that is knowing what works best for you, which I'm sure we'll touch on, um, later on. Um, I'm trying to think of like the best question to start <laughs> with, but I don't know necessarily that there's like one really good one. Cause there's so many parts of your mm -hmm. language thing that I want to touch on. I think maybe I definitely like to know, like starting off with this question, Okay, what are some common mistakes that people make um, when it comes to starting a new language? Because I feel mm -hmm. like if you're making mistakes right at the beginning, like that obviously will hinder you throughout this process. So do you notice any sort of common mistakes, um, maybe from your students or even mm -hmm. from your experience? So I think that from my experience, most people, here in, I'm in California and most people within the states, I'm most familiar with the California school systems, all of the, I've been through all of them, the Cal States, the UCs, the high school, the community college. And basically the way that those are set up is with the, like a two year language program and then a third year to do more fluency. I think the biggest mistake that people make, um, whether they are learning on their own or going through classes is that they rely just on the classes. They think that, okay, I'm going to go to this class. I'm going to do everything that's asked of me. And then I'm going to be fluent in a language. Mm -hmm. And while the classes do help, it's not enough to actually be able to speak a language fluently or read or write or listen or any of those right. skills. Because it's just like learning anything else. And it's just like when you learned your first language, you've spent your entire life, you know, 12 years of school practicing that language, it's mm -hmm. not going to be enough just to practice it going to class three hours a week for three years. No, I mean, I totally agree. I've heard so many people who have said things like, you know, I've taken four years of high mm -hmm. school French or Spanish and you get like baseline and stuff. But then when it comes to actually speaking it, mm -hmm. most people can't. Um, so it's definitely frustrating, but that's something that's really interesting too, is that a lot of people, um, I hear them say that, oh, I don't want to learn through classes because I want to just learn how to speak. Like, I just want to learn how to use daily, mm -hmm. you know, conversation. I don't want I don't necessarily need to know all the grammar and everything, but what yeah. they don't realize is that that's part of the process. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they need that process if they want to 
be able to, to speak fluency or at least to achieve a high level of fluency. Right. I think um, going off of that, I feel like a lot of people look for like the quick hack or like the quick mm-hmm. way to learn a language and there is no quick no. way. Like <laughs> to break it to you, there's no quick <laughs> hack how to do that. Um, and so a lot of people um, obviously going into it are can get discouraged very easily if they don't mm-hmm. see progress right away. And it's like when you're learning a language, you're signing up for like a lifelong thing because yeah. learning any language, I mean, English is my native language, mm-hmm. but there's still ways I can learn to be more fluent, but just by like yeah. learning the voca- vocabulary, there's still things in English where I'm, mm-hmm. you know, and so it's like, you're yeah. always just like a lifelong learner. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So I want to ask you about um, organization. Cause that's a huge okay. thing for me. Uh, <laughs> I definitely, you know, when you don't have that classroom structure, mm-hmm. it's hard to create that structure for yourself and like keep yourself organized. Mm-hmm. So did you have any, do you have any tips on how you stayed organized, whether if it was like certain notes or notebooks or maybe like even apps or some sort of system that you used when it comes to like organizing notes? or organizing yeah. your study routine, just like organization in mm-hmm. general. Okay. So I am extremely organized, almost to the point of annoyance. <laughs> and, uh, and so basically each time I start, each time I start a class or I start anything, my organization system is a little bit different because I, it, it's part of like having a style, like I have certain things that I like to do to organize. I like to use different colors of like highlighters and uh, sticky notes and things like that. But how I organize all my material for a particular class or whatever it is that I'm doing is based on what I need to achieve within that class. Mm -hmm. So one example of that, since I have it right here in front of me is like, this is I'm taking one online Spanish class right now and this is one class that is five weeks so they're all this each each week has a note and I ran out of tabs so I just like made them out of sticky notes here so Mm -hmm. it's not always the prettiest but uh, (laughs) it works for me because I know what everything in here means and then I just have each section within that week that way so Organization, I think, really comes down to understanding yourself as a learner, how what you need in order to be able to get to the results that you want. So it's not necessarily like, oh, do this. Like I would never tell someone, organize your class exactly like this, because that might not work for you. You need to know what you need. Like it that does work for you, then great. Like definitely learn different approaches and different styles that other people use, but then think about what you like and try them out. And if that works, then great, you can use that. And you also can use different techniques and then, you know, create a blend of them or create your own within that. It's really just a process of experimenting with what works and what doesn't and refining your own process organization. I think that's really good advice because I feel like I'm very organized in other aspects of my life but Mm -hmm. then when it comes to language learning I I don't have that much of like an organization and sometimes I'm like is that hindering me but then Mm -hmm. I also just feel like I can't keep up with like using like all the highlighters and all this kind of Mm -hmm. like just having like all these different files and I have a few notebooks and ones for like grammar and ones for like a journal and ones for more like vocabulary stuff and sometimes I'll get back into that um but I just find that I can't like keep up with it Mm -hmm. especially because I want to talk about this later but like as you shift from being a beginner learner to like Mm -hmm. later on when maybe you're not necessarily like going through all your conjugations every day because you're now just trying to get to the point where you can like speak better and, and comprehend more and just like expose yourself to the language versus when I first started Italian, I was doing that kind of thing where I was like trying to go through conjugations, trying to regularly study vocab and like have more of a structured, like working through all the basics of like the foundation of Italian. Um, So Mm -hmm. we'll touch on that like later. Yeah. And that's really interesting too, because part of that, process is like not just figuring out like what you need in order to get to that result but also understanding 
what you're actually going to do because you can Mm -hmm. say like, Oh, I'm going to do all these things. And if I do all of these things, like if I study every single day for an hour, then that's going to get me to this result. But if you know, you're not actually going to do it and you're just like, I know I'm not going to do then it's not going to do anything for you. So it's better to to think about like basically creating the ideal environment for yourself to learn. So Mm -hmm. if you know that you're a person who is not going to, you know, if you have all these notebooks and you're not going to use them or you have all these things and that you just like, you, you just won't do it if you're on your own, then that's where like, for instance, like with my, my course, like I know that even with, I have my Spanish novels and things that I, I try to read. And I just know that I just, I just get lazy about sometimes and I don't read them, but I know that yeah. if I have a course, then I'm going to be, I know I'm going to do it. So Mm -hmm. part of that is like getting into that mentality of, okay, what circumstance do I need to put myself in, in order to ensure that I'm going to actually do this? Right. Definitely. And I think that's kind of a good segue because I want to talk about motivation Mm -hmm. because I've struggled with this and so many people comment on my videos, like, how do you stay motivated? What do you do when you lose motivation? Mine definitely comes and goes because I have a very busy schedule and sometimes Italian kind of <laughs> falls to the back of the priority list. Um, do you have ways that you were able to keep up motivation? Because I've talked about some of my personal ways uh, in some of my videos, but you know, you mentioned like having a structured course. Mm-hmm. That's great. Is that also more structured kind of works for me sometimes. Um mm-hmm. But yeah, just ways that you stayed motivated or if you lost motivation, like how you got it back. Yeah, and that is a good question, <laughs> definitely, because motivation is huge. And I think it really does just go into figuring out ways to do things where you actually will do them. Mm-hmm. And so with like with my Spanish studies, that is that way with my um, my French study like right now which it doesn't really exist at this moment but it's been for a couple of years um with that so basically how I have thought about it for language is that I have I mean as a language teacher like I'm, I'm using language all the time and it's but it's not always like I'm using Spanish all the time it's just language because I just see it as all all of it is all of it's connected, whether you're using English or you're using Spanish or you're using French, whichever language, you're improving those language skills. So part of how I have improved is I have my courses that I know, like, even if I'm only taking one class at a time, it's going to take me a long time, but I know it's going to get uh, progress for me. I know that if I do all of those and the way that I do my work, I do absolutely everything and then some. So I know that I'm going to see that progress. And then even if I don't get to French for like a year or until if I can't do two classes at a time, mm-hmm. I know that if I keep going, I'm going to see that progress. So there is that. And then I also take time for like for reading in English, something I've been doing more lately, because it's even though it's English, it's what, like what you mentioned with your, your like our English learners, even though we're native. Yeah. Learners, is that I take that time to like, I want to relax. And instead of just like lying down and watching TV, mm-hmm. I relax by reading in English because it's easy for me, but it still mm-hmm. improves my ability to read and process information, which then transfers into any language that I'm using. So it's really, really that mentality. The motivation is all about how you think about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really interesting tip, actually, what you mentioned at the end about reading just in your native language, Mm -hmm. because I have a book in Italian that I have been trying to work through. And obviously it takes a lot longer that Mm -hmm. I finished like three books in English in the time that I'm trying to get through this one. Um, And it definitely like tires your brain out yeah. so much because, you know, I'll try to read, I, I've been trying to set a goal of just like a chapter or two and they're like rel- relatively short, but it's so mm-hmm. interesting how quickly your brain can fatigue when it's trying so hard to understand. Um, so that's really an interesting tip about reading in English um, kind of as like practice in a way. Mm-hmm. I also wanted to go into, because I feel like this is already getting long, and, <laughs> but I feel there's so much that I would talk about with you. Um, I want to get more into like some deeper stuff about 
pronunciation mm-hmm. or like understanding maybe like some colloquial things or things that a lot of people assume you can't get if you don't like live in the country. I know that you personally did do some like exchange yeah. study abroad. So that's, I definitely want to hear about that. Cause I'm sure that's very <laughs> important when it comes to learning a language but some people will even comment on my videos and say like you can't learn Italian unless you live there and I'm like no so um I just kind of want to ask you a little bit about um when it comes to like feeling more fluent in a way of, of mm-hmm. just like getting a better understanding of the language I'd love to hear about your experience when you were actually abroad but also ways that you might have tried to do that when you were here in California Okay, yeah, and that's a great question. And I mean, I'm, I'm fortunate enough that my language is Spanish, so it almost is like immersion in California, Southern California. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, but not to the extent that it is when I was studying in Spain or in Costa Rica. And mm-hmm. um, it, it definitely is faster. So for people like, who want to learn faster, I would yeah. say that that is the way to do that, to go through immersion into that. Because even in my, I did four weeks in each country, and I was, Really ambitious and I did it in one summer I did my <laughs> second year of Spanish I did four weeks and then I came home wow. for two weeks and then I went to the coast study for four weeks <laughs> and then I was done with my second year of Spanish in college so that did that that did help but um I also ended up with a lot of holes in my Spanish uh, grammar and vocabulary and the foundations because I went through so many different programs so that was good for that immersion and for the um, culture, but it's definitely not necessary to become fluent in a language, especially because of all of the resources that we have today. I would say that people who say like, oh yeah, have to go to another country. So it's like, that may have been true before, mm-hmm. but we have access to speakers of all languages from our home, there are computers. Right. So right. it's really not essential. And going back to reading as well is that that is an excellent way to learn many of those colloquialisms and to learn how native speakers use the language and to do it at at your own pace as well, because you 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 can take your time as you're reading. And it's even more structured. Like a lot of people think, they they tell tell me at least, that they're like, oh, I don't want to read because I just want to learn how to speak. Like I just want to learn how it's, it's spoken. Mm-hmm. But reading and writing is practice for speaking. So when you do that, you're, you know, you're working with more complex sentences, more, you know, uh, intricate styles of language. And so when you then apply that to speaking, which you can do at home through working with a tutor or like a, a language partner or anything online, and then you can practice those skills. So you can create your own immersion program there. Right. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. I think also, as you mentioned, how it's kind of being like immersion here mm-hmm. in California, you know, like people especially don't realize just how many people within your community could be. Mm-hmm. I was at the beach the other day I'm by myself because, you know, COVID, <laughs> six feet away. But I heard this family speaking in Italian, like mm-hmm. right now me and I was just like what are the odds that I went to a, the beach today and there was this Italian family and then there was more of them and they were all like mm-hmm. talking in Italian but I loved it because I was like wow, like I can actually understand them mm-hmm. and that's so crazy and it just reminded me that like there's people from all over the world living all over the place yeah. and you know I even remember like looking up some groups a few years ago like when I was still in LA um for like learning languages and stuff. And there's so many like exchange groups mm-hmm. where you can do that. And so like definitely look into that in your area, maybe after COVID, but um, <laughs> yeah. like there's so many ways that people don't even realize and so many resources that are open to them. And like you said, online, the whole internet is just filled with so many resources, like mm-hmm. free books you can download too. Um, but I also wanted to talk about, okay. So I touched on this a little bit earlier, how maybe your study can kind of like, your study routine kind of shift as Mm -hmm. you get to a higher level. Um, Not everyone who watches my videos are beginners and some people, especially me now that I feel like as I advance more, I wanna know more like how do you stay at an advanced level? And I I know a lot of people get to kind of a plateau where they feel like they're not progressing. Do you have tips for people who 
who are kind of at that plateau, like how do you progress? What things should they be incorporating into the their routine that maybe they're not to help them stay advanced, but also like keep getting more advanced? Yeah. So that's another great question. <laughs> it really, and it really just comes down to the way that you were thinking about it and continually assessing yourself as you go through. Because mm-hmm. if you were doing the exact same thing every day for, I don't know, several months or a year, like it's, that's not going to be beneficial to you because it's going to be the same thing. So it's really important to understand your process and your progress and to be reassessing. You, you can set up timelines when you're like, okay, I want to reassess quarterly. I want to reassess. Um, mm-hmm. you know, however often, which is basically the process I walk people through in my becoming bilingual book is like all of that. But essentially it's just thinking about, okay, I know that like I need to this is working, but this part of it's not working anymore. You don't have to wait until your quarter assessment time to change that out. It's really just about being very in tune with how you are learning and what is working and continuing to work and just constantly adjusting. Mm-hmm. So for, for people who just want like, do it this way and keep doing it this way, it doesn't, doesn't work. You, it's fine to do that and then to try it out, but then you really do have to think about it and make adjustments so that it is right for you at your current level because mm-hmm. people do get to that. And that pel- plateau also is basically like we were talking about before the first few years of learning the language or it's like two or three within our school systems over here that is like it's mostly memorization and drills and then once you get past that point like the third year is more application and it's changing a little bit the school um, system the curriculum and all of that they are starting to do more integration in the lower at the more beginning levels but that plateau I found is mostly the the usage, the application, which is my second program with Dojo. That's what I was teaching the application because it's where people get stuck is that they're like, okay, I did, I followed all the steps, but now what do I do? That's where the reading, writing, speaking, and listening comes in because mm-hmm. and you have to actually think and you have to actually process the information on your own and create and writing and like I think most people would agree that even in their native language like writing can be difficult and so when you have all these skills and you need to do them in another language it's like I don't know where to to go because there's not a step-by-step process necessarily for that but that's the next process is using it because if you think about how much you use your native language like how much time you spent writing in English throughout all of your schooling you were in a lot, like you went through all of your mm-hmm. school and your high school, you were in papers, and like that's how you achieve that level of fluency. It doesn't take nearly that amount of time to achieve it in another language because you already have those skills. You just you just need to use them for a new language, and you do need to develop them over several years. But it's not necessarily going to take decades to achieve the level that you have when you're say, twenty. Right. Right. Yeah. I think. Yeah, I, I really liked that like overview you did of kind of like that timeline of like breaking down your studying. And I think it's interesting because I feel like a lot of people kind of forget to look at like how you do study your native English. Mm-hmm. Like how we studied English in school. And like you said, you know, like writing, I mean, writing essays, like even though you're writing essays in English, writing essays were hard, you know, <laughs> in college, in high school, wherever. So definitely like thinking about just how you learned and got better your own language, like incorporating Mm -hmm. that into whatever language you're learning now. Um, I have one last question. I have so many more, but I'm just gonna choose like one. Um, I know a lot of people have asked me things like, because people have said like, oh, my friend or my friend's mom said she learned Spanish just by watching like telenovelas or Mm -hmm. like, you know, just watching TV series. Um, I feel like some people have tried to pick up a language just by like watching a ton of TV or watching a ton of good mm-hmm. things out there for you. I personally enjoy watching like Italian mm-hmm. series. Um, how effective do you think that is? I, I don't, I'm pretty sure you're not going to say you can learn a language just by watching <laughs> TV. Um, but how effective is that? And what are you getting from that? Just so people understand what you are actually getting mm-hmm. from watching shows and stuff like that. 
Okay, so if you're watching the show, you are listening, and and you're also getting a little bit of the culture as well as you're watching. Yeah, I see that too. And but essentially, that's what you're getting. You're getting uh, listening, so listening and comprehension as well, which is important for pretty much any aspect for your reading or whatever it is. But the only way that you can actually learn how to speak is by speaking. <laughs> so right. it does help, but you can't just listen to a, a movie or watch a movie and listen to it for, you know, an hour or two and then be able to, yeah. speak. you actually do have to practice. If you want to learn how to speak, you need to practice speaking. And then, you know, or if your, your goal is writing or reading, whatever it is, you have to practice those skills as well. So mm -hmm. it definitely is useful because it's, it's that other, it's that component that of listening, which is, you know, with the, your four basically components of language learning, the reading, writing, speaking, and listening. And it is, that component so it's important to use them together but also you know you can practice them in isolation and that can be one of your relaxation activities for right you know for your language learning to keep you going so I would say to use it in that way kind of like a relaxation activity say oh I'm gonna watch yeah. a movie but um instead of just watching one in English I'm gonna watch it in a language that I'm trying to learn so that I can also keep progressing that way, but I can also relax. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's good. And that's, that's pretty much what I use it for as well. Mm -hmm. Now that I'm thinking about it, like last night I watched a movie in Italian just for relaxation and, or I watch like YouTubers um, because mm -hmm. I feel like that also helps me get some more like colloquial stuff. Just, you know, if they're interacting with their friends or just like fun little stuff that they say you know, you can pick that kind of stuff up because that's not necessarily like in your textbooks or yeah. resources that you're reading online. Um, like I said, I <laughs> seriously have so many more questions, but I know we've talked about potentially doing other collaborations and doing Instagram lives and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. I don't think this will be the last you see of Sarah <laughs> on my channel or my social media, but before this video ends, um, you have mentioned a few times about your course. So can you let people know, um, where they can find you, first of all, on social media, but also some other resources and things that you provide for other language learners. Yeah. So as I mentioned in the beginning as well, my YouTube channel and my website really has everything on there that you need to know. So it is just my name. It's sarahvigil.com. And I have, so I do have, I mentioned both my book and my course, and those are the two ways that you can really access this information in like a, a structured environment. And then of course there is my YouTube channel as well. Uh, my book is Becoming Bilingual and basically it's understanding the process of language acquisition from monolingual to bilingual because that was my experience. And then all of the study strategies and like methodology and processes that I learned throughout that process. The next step to that is my course, Linguist Dojo, which is, which I call Linguist Dojo. I feel like I should mention briefly that it's Linguist Dojo because I also study martial arts and a lot of the practices that I learn and that I teach are very much influenced by that as well. And dojo comes from Japanese, <laughs> from, uh, from martial arts and karate. So linguist dojo, it is a place for learning basically everything about language, focusing on reading, writing, speaking, and listening. Essentially, it is that intermediate to advanced level. And it is like you were asking, Shay, like how do you get past that plateau? That's what that course teaches. It teaches you all of the techniques that you need to know for practicing each of those four course skills. So what are the different styles of writing you need to know, different styles of speaking and you know, listening and reading, and then also integration and the study skills for that as well. So it is, you go from the beginning, becoming bilingual, and then the intermediate to advanced that level. And that is all on my website. And I have a code for you as well, Shay, that is so that anyone who is interested in becoming bilingual can get 20% off of their copy of that book. And I, I guess we will probably link it down below. 
yeah, I will definitely link that down below because now I feel like everyone watching this is like, I need to get it. <laughs> so <laughs> I will definitely be right. And you've read it already. So yeah. Yes, I have. And I found that it was very, very helpful. Even, even like some cool like mindset stuff, you know, mm -hmm. just like getting prepped for like getting the right mindset to learn a new language. But yeah, very effective. Mm -hmm. Um, oh, and here is a physical copy, by the way, of oh, what that, look at that looks like. So Beautiful. <laughs> see that, which I haven't announced yet, but I'll announce it here that I am, there is going to be an opportunity to get physical copies within my course program. Oh, so you heard it here yeah. first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, but yes, yeah, so I will definitely link all that below. Um, and I'm just so happy that we were able to talk. I feel like I learned so much and I'm sure my audience learned so much and I'm excited to continue asking you more stuff um either in another video or instagram so definitely everybody stay tuned for further chats with Sarah. <laughs> for the next time um yes and we will also be doing another type of chat on her channel so be sure to go check out that video and future collaborations but thank you for this chat i'm very excited that we did it and i will see you very soon <laughs> bye guys